I know the uh, title was Money, Banking, and the Current Mess, um, but I don't think I'll get beyond money um, today and, and certainly won't get to uh, the current mess. But uh, when we talk about money, the first thing we need to talk about is how money originated. And uh, ori money did not originate uh, by order of the state. Um, eventually, you're going to go to college and you're going to learn that that's what happened, but that is not the case. Uh, money originated in the free market and it originates in barter. Um, goods are produced by those that are good at it and those who are good at um, producing a particular good, um, they will have surplus of these goods. When they have surplus of these goods, they will trade those goods for other goods that they don't, uh, that they don't produce. Um, they'll trade with someone who is good at producing those goods. So I always like to uh, uh, use the, uh, the log man and the egg lady when I'm talking about this. And if you were the log man and you had a, a grove of trees and uh, you, would have extra, you would have extra firewood. And down the road, there would be uh, uh, a lady with extra, she has chickens, and the chickens are laying eggs, and certainly more eggs than, than she can eat. So uh, there's the, the immediate potential for these two folks to, to trade. Um, the egg lady's going to need to get rid of some eggs, and she's going to need some firewood to keep her warm. The log man is going to have extra logs and uh, he's gonna need something to eat, so he's gonna wanna trade logs for, for eggs. And eventually there would be some sort of uh, exchange would happen. You might have a, an egg um, equal to a medium-sized log. So the, uh, the egg lady would trade one egg for medium-sized log, um, but you know, those, those terms of exchange could change depending on um, uh, supply factors of, of logs or supply factors of, of chickens. Let's say some of the chickens died, and uh, if some of the chickens died, the egg lady would have fewer eggs to trade with, and um, so she would need to use a certain number of those eggs to eat, so she'd be less likely to, to um, trade eggs, and she would demand maybe two logs for each one of, of the eggs that she wanted to trade for. Conversely, if some of the there was a fire and the forest uh, part of the trees of the the log man's trees uh, burned down, he'd probably want uh, maybe two logs for every egg. So you can see how these exchange rates um, would change even in barter. Now the the main problem with barter immediately comes up, and that is what's called the double coincidence of wants. If you're bartering with somebody, you need to, number one, find someone who wants what you have, right? And they have to want what you have. And that's the double co coincidence of wants. So if, if, you're the, if you're the log man and you, you have to find somebody who, who has eggs, if that's what you want, and um, also the egg lady has to want logs. And that's pretty tough to do. You can see that an economy that's driven uh, by barter or uses a barter system, uh, it uh, limits trade tremendously. Second problem uh, with barter is indivisibility. I mean, you can cut logs in little pieces and trade, um, trade with those logs, but eggs don't divide very well. Try to cut an egg in half and it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't work necessarily very well. So indivisibility is a problem. The other problem is business calculation. Now, if, you're, if you've got uh, a grove of trees and you sell, sell logs, but uh, you, take, uh, you trade logs for any number of things, how can you determine whether you're having a profit or whether you're, um, you're having a loss? It's, it's impossible if you're trading for eggs or shoes or any number of different things that you may be trading for. So these are the problems with, uh, with barter and thus um, the need for a medium of exchange. And that's what develops when you have um, a good that 
trades, not just for its usefulness, uh, an egg for what you would eat, but maybe an egg that you may want to trade for. And that's what becomes money, is um, this medium exchange. And actually, <clears throat> this is explained uh, very well by uh, Mr. Jeffrey Tucker, um, who you will hear from later, in a piece recently he wrote for, uh, I guess he wrote it a long time ago, but we continue to reprint it over and over and over again, uh, uh, Halloween and its candy economy. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you guys still trick or treat, um, a couple of you look like you could still be in costume, I guess, but, uh, uh, just kidding. But uh, uh, if you do still uh, trick or treat, you go, you know how it works. You, you go from door to door, you have a big bag, and um, you're kind of at the whim of the, uh, of the <clears throat> mean folks uh, at each stop in terms of what they're going to give you. And at the end of the night, you, ended up, you end up with a, a big bag of uh, various uh, candy and, and other things that, uh, that uh, these people, um, people give you. I know in my day, we hated to get like apples and anything healthy like that. I mean, that's just um, that, uh, you know, Halloween is not for health, um, it's for for chocolate and gooey stuff and things like that, but occasionally you get the mean old lady down the street who insists on giving you an apple, and of course then you hear, start hearing about razor blades and apples and crazy stuff like that. But um, anyway, in Jeff's piece, he, he uh, talks about how uh, a medium of exchange appears uh, in candy on Halloween night. Um, he has a, has a big family and he lives in a, you know, very prosperous neighborhood here in, uh, here in Auburn. And uh, so the kids all came over to his house and they dump out their bags of, uh, of candy. And uh, there's trading, right? You get, uh, you know, you've got so many Reese's and you got so many Snickers and you got some popcorn balls and you got some blow pops and you got all this stuff. And uh, people started trading because you don't like all this stuff. And, um, there's these various transactions going on, but eventually what happens is that one of the candies becomes the medium of exchange. It's the candy that um, uh, kids would trade for because they knew, not that they wanted to eat it or to consume it, but they knew that they could trade it for something else. And in this case, it turned out to be the micro-sized Three Musketeers bar. And that's because everybody knew what it was. It was small and bite-sized, and uh, it worked very well for, uh, for this exchange. And so um, you can see how this, uh, this would happen. Over time, um, uh, kids would think beyond uh, just consuming their candy. They started trading for these bite-sized uh, uh, Three Musketeers, and um, they even started hoarding them and saving them, thinking that they would make a better deal as the night went on. And uh, ultimately, the, the Three Musketeers uh, served to facilitate uh, other exchanges. So it's a very good piece to read and uh, something that you can see um, very quickly in how, um, how a money develops or a medium of exchange of, develops even in, uh, even in Halloween candy. And at the end of the night, everybody was happier. That's the key to the story. Some, some kids had less, some kids had more, but through this medium of exchange, they were able to make trades that made them better off and everybody was happier than they were when they just showed up with this big bag of candy that some of it they liked and some of it they didn't like, et cetera. Now, you can see that money is, it's a huge leap forward in the history of civilization. If we were all bartering, uh, we couldn't trade for, uh, you wouldn't be able to trade your time and talent uh, for, uh, for money and then go buy what you want. You would, again, you'd be trapped by this double coincidence of wants. 
So money has, uh, has served to, to really civilize uh, the world. And um, businesses are now able to calculate whether they're making money or whether they're losing money. All goods can be priced in, uh, in money or, or the commodity that is in money. Now, a number of things have been money over the years. Um, salt, sugar, cattle, iron hose, tea, cowrie shells, and even, uh, in a very famous case, cigarettes in uh, prison camps have developed as uh, money. And in fact, I think, uh, I think cigarettes are probably still used as money uh, in prisons. So, so what kind of goods are, are picked as money? Well, it's a commodity that, number one, is generally marketable, which means it has to have a, a high non-monetary demand. Now, just in the case of that Three Musketeers bar, uh, it was good not only as a medium of exchange, but it was good to eat as well. So um, money should be generally marketable. Number two, it should be divisible. That was the problem with our egg problem that we had earlier. It's hard to divide up an egg unless you scramble it. Um, chopping up eggs doesn't work very well, so you need, uh, you need goods that, uh, that are divisible. They need to have a high value per unit weight. That means it's portable. So in the past, cattle have been money, but cattle are pretty hard to carry around with you. So they don't make particularly good money. So uh, high value per unit weight is important. Fairly stable value. Money should, uh, should uh, retain its value over time. Number five, it should be durable. Uh, again, that's a problem with, uh, uh, with tea, uh, possibly with the cigarettes I've mentioned, uh, some of the other things that have been uh, money in the past, is that they're not necessarily uh, terribly durable. Number six, recognizable. Everybody should recognize the value of what money will be. Um, certainly in the case uh, at the Tucker residence, on Halloween, everyone recognized that uh, Three Musketeers bars um, were, um, uh, were, a, were a good that uh, everybody recognized the value of. And they should be homogeneous. That's the other problem with the candy is that uh, there's various types of candy. And so um, uh, a money should be the same. When we talked about the logs, not all logs are created equal. And uh, so the perfect money, uh, monies that will truly last throughout history, uh, will be homogeneous. They'll be uh, roughly the same. And as you might expect, over time, two commodities have been dominant to compete as money. And that is gold and silver. And uh, Gold used to be money. If you can see that, hopefully. Um, that uh, is an 1895 $20 gold piece. And that's what used to be, that's what used to be money here in the United States. And for good reason. You know, it's gold was, uh, has always been highly prized for its luster and for its ornamental value. Don't pay any attention to this white that's around it. It's in plastic. It's going to stay in plastic. It's also not going to get passed around. So don't ask me. <laughs> don't ask me to do that. Just stay right up here. Want to come to me individually? Uh, no problem. Um, so. Gold and silver have always, um, uh, have always served this role as money. It's relatively scarce, has a high value uh, per unit weight. It's very portable. Um, it's divisible. And in fact, uh, we just had a conference last uh, weekend in Newport Beach, and we were talking about gold and how divisible it is. We were talking about if anybody's familiar with the Golden Dome at Notre Dame, and that is actually in gold flake. Done that in gold flake. 
And uh, the question was, how much gold did it take to cover the Golden Dome at Notre Dame? It's less than half an ounce of gold. So gold can be spread uh, very thin and, uh, and thus is uh, very highly uh, divisible. It's also highly durable. Again, that's a coin from uh, 1895. Occasionally you will hear stories of shipwrecks well, at the bottom of the sea, they'll pull gold up and it has the same luster that it had um, when the coins were newly minted. So what should be the, the supply of money? I mean, we get this question all the time. If you watch any of the financial news, they'll ask about the money supply, what should the money supply be? And we never talk about uh, that in terms of other things like biscuits or shoes. Nobody ever sits around and goes, oh my gosh, how, you know, how many biscuits should we have? How many shoes should we have? Uh, we let the market determine that, right? But somehow um, now it's thought that uh, uh, somehow the government uh, should determine how much money we should have. Um, but uh, the difference between other goods and money, the difference between biscuits and money, are that we're all better off if there are more biscuits. More biscuits are better than less biscuits. But having more money, as opposed to less money, uh, we're not any better off. In fact, if we doubled the amount of money overnight, none of us would be any better off because goods and services haven't changed. It makes our lives um, uh, worth living and, and uh, the things that we use every day are the labor and capital and goods and the amount of money doesn't really uh, play into that. So it's, um, if society is better off with goods and services, but not necessarily with more, more money. If the amount of money was uh, doubled overnight, prices would just go up. Prices would roughly double. It wouldn't double overnight. Some stuff, some goods and services would go up quicker than others. But um, uh, society as a whole would not be better off with, uh, with more money. So the market's perfectly capable of deciding what's, uh, what its own money supply should be. But um, unfortunately, uh, the government has uh, uh, gotten involved in this over, uh, over centuries and centuries, and uh, which leads us to the uh, discussion of counterfeiting. Now, when you counterfeit, uh, gold is very hard to counterfeit. Um, when you hold an ounce of gold, you immediately know by weight what it is. It's very easy to uh, determine um, gold and whether it's really gold or something else. But if you um, were to counterfeit, try to counterfeit gold, you actually are, uh, uh, you're, hurt, you're harming everyone. You're harming everyone who, uh, all the other legitimate money holders are harmed when you create uh, money out of nowhere. And of course, as you can imagine, counterfeiters benefit first. If you can't make money, uh, if you are able to create gold and uh, be able to pass it off as gold, say you made it out of brass or something else, um, you would be benefit by, by being able to uh, use that as money, trade it for goods and services and uh, uh, at the expense of all other money holders. And if you want to guarantee a spot in jail, <laughs> counterfeit. Get into the counterfeiting <clears throat> business because the government uh, is the counterfeiter and they do not like competition. <laughs> so, um, like I say, if you, if you absolutely positively want to go to prison, uh, get into the counterfeiting business. Now, counterfeiting uh, took a big leap forward when, uh, when government got in the money business, or the paper money business. And uh, that's what this is. Um, this is what passes for 20 bucks today. Again, I go back to uh, 1895. It was this. Now that's 20 bucks. Is that right there? And... Uh, uh, government is able to uh, insist that, that people uh, trade with that money, with that paper money, through legal, legal tender laws. 
In other words, uh, in the United States, you couldn't decide that uh, this red, blue, and black pen are legal tender. You couldn't trade for those. You couldn't create contracts. You can't create a contract in gold, per se. Um, the government prohibits that. Uh, the United States government insists that you take um, poor old uh, Andy Jackson there as, uh, as legal tender. Now, originally, uh, um, governments went to paper money, but it was backed by gold. So you might have had uh, the uh, $20 bills uh, circulating, but at least there was gold uh, backing them up. Eventually, over time, that goes away. The last, uh, last bit of uh, tying of uh, gold to, to paper was in 71, and uh, Richard Nixon uh, undid that last tie. And uh, he said, we're all Keynesians now. And uh, at that point, government then is, uh, is not constricted by the supply of gold, can create all the paper that it wants. And uh, as uh, my old teacher, Murray Rothbard, used to say, uh, the government at that point is now in seventh heaven. They can, uh, they can create all the paper they want, uh, to pay for what they want to pay for, uh, various government programs, um, you know, health care is being talked about, uh, wars in various places around the globe, et cetera, et cetera. And then gold is derided as a barbaric relic. You know, people who uh, have gold are uh, viewed with suspicion, uh, and the fact that, I'm, that I have uh, uh, some of the yellow metal makes me immediately suspect with some people. And uh, so uh, paper money is the, the hip thing to uh, have, and that's what uh, uh, everybody, everybody trades with. Now, just uh, a bit about the demand for money. You know, we have a, we've talked a little bit about the supply of money. Then you have the demand for money. Um, you know, goods and, goods and services are increasing every year. So if you had the supply of money was relatively static, then the price of those goods and services would fall. And in fact, prices did fall from the mid 18th century until uh, roughly about 1940. Uh, unless there was uh, the war years, um, prices did fall. So instead of this continual uh, price increases that we've had in recent years, especially since 1971, prices would fall because as more and more goods and services are produced, the amount of money was uh, held somewhat the same or static, uh, then prices of goods and services would fall. But uh, of course that hasn't been the case. The, the, uh, the money supply since 1980 has grown, um, I believe by 460%. And thus, we have a lot of money um, floating, uh, floating around. Um, eventually, the government, uh, when they print money um, and they need money, uh, it used to be that when uh, they needed to inflate uh, gold coins, they would just shave a little bit off of them. And they would take the shavings and uh, bundle them up and make new coins and pay for their programs. That was back in the ancient times. Of course, with the printing press, uh, it's very easy. You can just uh, put bigger numbers on them. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a 10,000 uh, dinar note from the Bank of Iraq. Uh, I picked this up this morning. I was down at my friendly Bank of Iraq branch here, Auburn. <laughs> It's amazing what people will give you on the road these days, but I uh, had a guy trying to buy me lunch one day with this. But anyway, you can see there's a very handsome guy on there. Um, still has his head in that picture, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, um, I, I looked up the initial, now 10,000 dinar sounds like a lot, right? Um, I looked up the official uh, on the internet exchange and uh, uh, that's worth about eight bucks. Um, U.S. Uh, today, so um, but as you know, as governments need to uh, uh, pay for more and more of their programs, uh, they uh, they just add zeros, and they add zeros, and they add zeros, and then ultimately, what happens is um, 
what's happened in, uh, I mean, you want to see a big note. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, uh, this is a hundred trillion dollars. Hundred, yeah, a hundred trillion dollars. Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. <laughs> now imagine, um, imagine you saved your entire life and you worked hard and you put money away and you saved up a hundred trillion. And, um, and you thought, you know, I've got a comfortable retirement because I got a hundred trillion. <laughs> well, <laughs> online yesterday, this is worth about uh, the amount of a Happy Meal down the street at McDonald's. <laughs> I actually think it's probably worth less than that in U.S. dollars, but, um, but just to show you that I'm not poor, I've actually got two of them. <laughs> so, um, but this is what can happen when, uh, um, when government gets a hold of the printing press, they want to create money out of nowhere, uh, to pay for uh, um, to pay for their uh, their misdeeds. So, um, and this has happened numerous times, not just in Zimbabwe, various countries in uh, in um, South America, and of course uh, the the famous uh, uh, Weimar Germany uh, in uh, in 1923, and in fact. Uh, uh, of course, the hyperinflations don't uh, happen all at once. Um, they happen in stages, and, and Ludwig von Mises uh, explained that uh, uh, initially in phase one, prices, they don't rise as much as the money supply because the public still has deflationary expectations. Your expectations of prices are really based on your most recent past. So right now, you don't think prices are going going up. If you got money, you wouldn't necessarily immediately run out and spend it. Um, in phase two, instead of rising money, uh, demand for money, moderating price increases, a uh, falling demand for money will intensify price inflation. And what falling demand for money will mean is that as soon as uh, people get money, they have no demand to hold that money. They're going to turn around and spend it on anything as quickly as they can. And of course, in phase three, as Mises explained, prices go up faster than money supply. There's a shortage of money, um, and uh, money's disappearing. Um, and in the, uh, in the German hyperinflation, workers were paid twice a day. And uh, housewives would stand at the gate with a wheelbarrow, and their husband would run out to the gate and throw the money they had been paid into the wheelbarrow. Uh, the wives would go to the store, and they would buy anything, anything they could get their hands on. And uh, of course, ultimately this collapses. There's no goods to buy. That's the situation in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe used to be a very prosperous country. Um, used to be the breadbasket of Africa. And through printing money, they've essentially just completely destroyed <coughs> that economy. But uh, in the case of the German, uh, German mark uh, in 1914, one mark equaled uh, 25 cents or a quarter of a dollar. By October of 23, it took 25.3 billion marks for a dollar. And a month later, it took 4.2 trillion marks to equal a dollar. So you can see how quickly this happens in a hyperinflation. Uh, certainly not predicting that as I stand here today, but just to give you an idea of what can happen uh, as we go from what the market considers money, uh, going from barter to gold and silver, uh, but when it turns into paper, it can be something that is uh, very deadly. So with that, uh, since I put you in a good mood, it's time for a break. So you have 15 minutes, and then it's back for Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> 